Welcome to another episode of Business with Passion. Each show features guests who have transformed their long-term passion into a successful business. I'm your host, Jay Hamilton Roth. My marketing strategy business grew from my love of talking with passionate business owners. In this series, I share their passion with you. So if you're looking for inspiration to enhance your business passion, keep watching. My long-term passion is to just make this world a better place when I'm finally going to leave it. To leave it behind better than I found it, that is my long-term passion. I was probably about 18 years old, maybe even younger when I discovered that passion. I knew, I knew for absolutely sure that I wanted to be with people and that I wanted to help people. Animals I love too, but people and need those two things that really, really grab my heart. I lived in Germany at the time. I was studying business administration. And that was not necessarily something that came from my heart that was more a little bit dictated. And I can say that now because my parents will listen from another place and be probably very understanding by this time. Um, so also on the side then, I was interested in learning about children with disabilities, specifically blind children and people who couldn't hear. And I wormed my way into what ultimately turned out to be just be there. Be there for people when they are in need. And I could figure that my path would find itself. It would, I would find the path, it would find me. Somewhere it would come together. And yeah, that's how it all started. I came to be doing what I am doing now, which is feeding people with life-threatening illnesses through the passing of my mom. That was an experience that I could describe as grand, deep, and for me, definitely life-changing. My mom was my best friend. She was my mentor. She was love. And her last final lesson to me was to know that there is other than just what you can see, feel, hear, and smell. There is beyond. And so I was on that search after her passing to see where is she, what is that lesson, what can I do, and what, how can she guide me. So I came to California after the experience. My mom passed in Germany. I came to California. I had two young children at the time. I read a story in the Chronicle, and it told a story about an elderly woman her name was Ruth Brinker, and she single-handedly founded an organization that is known as Project Open Hand. And Project Open Hand started through her getting to know about friends that she used to see at the grocery store and one day didn't show up. However, she had noticed that one of them got smaller and slimmer and looked kind of sicklish. So she asked the owner of the grocery store, where is and, oh, don't you know he's very ill? No, what's wrong with him? Oh, I think he has AIDS. Oh, okay, so how is he eating? I don't know. So Ruth made it to his house, his home, his apartment, and saw him there hungry. Didn't have food, had not had food for about a week. And she started cooking and feeding him. And he said, you know, I have another friend and he's in the same situation. If you cook a little more, maybe he could eat too. Oh, absolutely no problem. So from 2 to 10 to 20 to 80 to finally 2,000 people a day, that's what Project Open Hand is. At the time, I was a designer for leather goods. And I said to the people at my office, about 10 people, let's do something outside of ourselves. And we sat down and thought about it, I brought the idea of Project Open Hand, and everybody thought that was fabulous. And so that's what we did. We started at Open Hand, two people at a time, and rotating uh, our chores. Partly I paid, partly the employees let go of some of their income, and we got a lot of experience. And that's how all of that started. However, then I read that there was a huge need here in Marin because Marin at the time had the second highest 
occurrence per capita in AIDS in California. At the time, it was after San Francisco. That was in 1993. And so I said, that's easy. We'll do it in Marin. And when I say that's easy, that's when trouble begins. <laughs> so we started, I started looking around for the organization that was doing it here, and there was none. So the next thought was, well, then let's start something. What do you need? You need pots, you need pans, you need a, a fire, you need good taste, you need to know that people like your food. My kids like my food, so what can go wrong? People that don't feel so well need comfort food, and that's how I got started. Um, of course, I wanted to always meet Ruth Brinker. And so I said a word at my children's school that I had started this uh, project and I would love to meet Ruth at some point in time. And the next day she called me. Somebody had heard it. So here's serendipity at work. Somebody had heard it. Ruth heard it. She called me and she says, I hear what you're doing in Marin. And I said, oh, Mrs. Brinker, I'm not doing anything yet. I'm thinking about it. Oh, well, let's meet. Okay, when would you like to get together? I think, you know, in a month or so. Tomorrow. So I felt that real sense of urgency in her, which she transposed to me in our meeting the next day. From there, she said, what do you need? And I said, I need a board and I need to be established. She said, well, I have an attorney, he can help you and I'll be your first board member. That's how Mills Marin got started. And the first time we cooked, the first time we did anything to feed people was March 3rd, 1993. That was a grand moment. And I had two clients, they came to us through hospice. And the first client was a young man with AIDS and the second client was a young woman with a child, two year old girl, and the mother had AIDS. And so I got the two clients, I started cooking, it was beef stew, one of my mom's favorites. I thought it was appropriate. My kids tried it, so, hmm, good mama. So we delivered, and it was a very deep and a very uh, amazing experience. And I knew at that moment that I would only stop if I wasn't needed anymore. And coming back from my second client, Barbara, I sat in the car, literally, and people looked at me strangely because here is this woman driving in a Jeep going, yeah, we can do it, I did it, this is great, it's working. And so, ever since, 16 years ago, we've been, yeah, we can do it. That's my passion. Mom Today serves 120 people, plus minus, every single day. We still do the seven day thing because the tummy still doesn't close down on Saturdays and Sundays. Mom also serves two meals a day, a hot dinner and a cold lunch. And most of our food is actually organic. Our beef is organic, most of our produce is. Um, also, when I look back of how I did things some 16 years ago and how we're doing them now on a bigger scale, it's pretty much the same principle. And the principle is, you don't turn anybody away who qualifies. People who need the food are deeply in need and they don't pay. They get taken care of. For many, this is very unusual, especially, and that worries me very much when I see it, especially women with breast cancer often feel shamed by needing and not being able to take care of their families. Mom today also is 120 volunteers every week that we need. And if we don't have them, then we really, really start running around the county because we do feed everybody. We've never missed a meal. Um, qualification for clients, prospective clients is simple. All we need to know what their illness is and we need to have that confirmed through a doctor, which can be done through fax from the doctor's office. 
if the need is really great, which often it is because people feel often shamed by not being well, and they wait until the last second to ask for help. And oftentimes it's like, when do you need the food? Oh, as soon as possible. So it still happens today that we feed the very same day. If the call comes in before noon, we possibly can eke out an extra dinner and make sure that that person gets fed right away before all the official intake is done. As of today, we have served over 900,000 meals. And those are meals that would not ever have been eaten if Meals of Marin hadn't been there. Deeply satisfying. Those 900,000 meals aren't the last ones we keep on rolling and the need is getting bigger. And as a matter of fact, what we see right now, as the economy is not very healthy, people that had been teetering on the, on the corner there fall over the edge and they need help. People who get sick may not have health insurance, major expenses coming their way, the whole family goes into a tailspin over one family member being so deadly ill, fighting for their life, and there is no end to it that I see. I was convinced that once the AIDS crisis was over, we could fold and that was it and we've done something wonderful. And actually in the meantime, we have widened our mission. And here you can see how life plays when I said in the first place that things will come around, they find their way. I started feeding people with AIDS and about five years into it we got asked if we could feed people with breast cancer. And of course, yes, full circle. Um, and instead of having to widen our mission once more, we then opened up to say all people with life-threatening illnesses under the age of 60 and the reason being is we do not wish to duplicate services that will be taken care of by other organizations, such as Meals on Wheels, they feed people over 60. Meals of Marin feeds people under 60 with life-threatening illnesses. Um, the homeless are taken care of by St. Vincent's. Completely different. What we have in common is food, a basic human need. Um, and the need, when I see our clients, I see where our needs are. Our needs are huge, and they have grown over the years, as you might imagine. We need produce, we need staples, such as rice and beans, and those have to be purchased. We go gleaning, but that doesn't cover everything. We need meat, we need poultry, and the rare occasion that we get fish, I would love to expand because it's really good for our clients for getting their health back, if it is to be that they get healthy again. We definitely need people that love, love, love us and love what we do and feel the same passion as we do about making this place a better world. One meal at a time, that's how Meals of Marin does it. A direct outcome of what we do here at Meals of Marin is also an incredible relationship with local farmers. They have been incredibly, incredibly generous to us. And just like with volunteers, without the farmers, we would not be able to fulfill our mission. Every Sunday and every Thursday, we go to the farmer's market. I go religiously every time. And farmers give us leftover produce of the finest. You should think that this leftover stuff would have blemishes and this and that. No, it is absolutely beautiful. And most of it is organic. Uh, we are deeply indebted and we're deeply grateful. And if you can do anything for yourself and your family and for the community, go shop at the farmer's market. I think of Barbara, my second client I ever served with her little two-year-old daughter. and. It makes me happy and makes me sad at the same time. We fed Barbara and she was very, very ill of AIDS. And because of having nutrition day in and day out, she began to feel better. And she was able to hang in there until the drug cocktails actually came around. And she decided to go east to take care of her affairs. 
So she left, it made me sad and happy because she was able to do that. She took her daughter with her. And then a while later, like in 10 years later, I get a phone call. Hi, this is Barbara, do you remember me? How could I forget? She had such a distinct voice. And she said, I wanted to thank you because I get to see my daughter being 12 years old now and without you giving me that start with good nutrition, I would have never been able to do that. And my regret is, she said, come and visit. And I pushed it away a little bit because I didn't have time that day. And a week later, of course, she still had the virus in her. She cut herself, got an infection, and passed on before I got around to visit her. So that taught me something. If you have that, that instinct, that inkling, you need to see somebody, go do it. Well, how does this all happen? It happens, of course, through volunteers. It happens through people giving us in-kind donations. But really, the unsexy stuff, the electricity, uh, the wages, anything that makes this organization function needs real money. So we're asking for donations, and we would be deeply grateful if you find it in your heart to open your purse strings wide because it takes about $700,000 a year to make this all work, to operate Meals of Marin. And just picture this, yes, we do buy food, we buy all the staples, we have to, we buy all the expensive things such as uh, the meat and the chickens. And we definitely need to make sure that the basics, the operating costs, are covered. PG&E will want to be paid, and fuel, we need to be able to pick up things and deliver. Yes, our volunteers do deliver the food in their own cars and with their own gas. However, we also have deliveries to make when we don't cover all the routes. So we look for our corporate sponsors, we look for the individual donor, and we will take any amount of money. We will take $10, we will take $10,000. Uh, we are just really grateful when people find us and help us cover a basic need in a county that most people would believe that there is no need at all. But there is, there is an underbelly in Marin that often is not seen, is very hidden, and for people that are battling for their lives, oftentimes it is also shameful in a way, because that is part of our society. I'm sure we will overcome that, but in the meantime, there's real, real need for donations and for checks and for money that will help us sustain this. Fundraising becomes hard when the economy sours. And to me, it makes no sense whatsoever that a nonprofit should suffer. Um, there's got to be a way. That is just how I was raised. That's how I operate. So since we are foodies already, a very natural way of raising money for us is to cook also for profit and then have that profit go directly into Meals of Marin to feed people who we serve. And it has taken two forms. One is catering, and I don't mean to compete with any caterer or with any restaurant, but I would cater to people that need a special event that's maybe too small for a big caterer or short notice and oh my god where we're we going with that um, it helps us and as people eat and as we can bring them great food absolutely fabulous food for their party they also know and that's the little twist with our organization that they are in fact feeding somebody else who's not just as fortunate as we are the other way that we raise money through food preparation is we go to other organizations who have shut-ins and maybe don't have a kitchen and have to bring food in from outside. And we have several organizations that we do that for and we bring either hot dinners or hot lunches uh, to a minimum of 20 people. 
Uh, and that again is for profit. We charge for it and the money goes back directly into Meals of Marin feeding people who can't feed themselves. We are not as green as I would like for us to be. So one big goal, one big vision would be to have Meals of Marin be a green soup kitchen. We are not just a soup kitchen, but for the term, we would like to go and have solar power because we have a horrendous PG&E bill every month with all the cooling that we need. Um, I would love to see that we get electric vehicles, hybrids if must, but electric vehicles because as of this moment, we have a huge carbon footprint on our earth and that is not in congruence with the philosophy of making this world a better place to live. I can see us very fast running out of space right here. We're already uh, putting out about 300 to 400 meals every day. And when I answer the phone and I have somebody on the phone who doesn't qualify because he or she is not inflicted with a life-threatening illness, but with a chronic illness, that feels very bad. My dream would be for Meals of Marin to be able to feed people that are ill and can't feed themselves, irregardless of if it is a life-threatening illness or a chronic illness, so that people just simply have that basic need for food covered when they don't feel well enough to feed themselves. I have one small advice, and it sounds even a little cheesy, but if you have fire in the belly and you have a thought or a passion, my advice be, do it. Just go and start. Things will fall in place. I'm an example for that. And the interesting thing is, when you start something and you believe in it, that has a certain attraction and people will flock to you and help you out. If, you are, if I had been sitting down and thinking real hard when I started Meals of Marin, probably would have never started it. I had two small children, I was a designer, I had a business here in America, I had one in Europe, and I was traveling the world pretty much twice a year. Did I have time? No, but I started Meals of Marin, and that's the only thing I do now. Serendipitous? Everything that I did led me to this point. So have trust. My tip to anybody who has a great thought of something that really should get done, go ahead, do it, help will come. People are flocking to the organization for two reasons. One is the mission and the other is the feeling that it leaves with you once you are involved. So I can see myself being involved, but I do see that we eventually will need somebody who will step in and be the executive director. Should I step down and when I step down, I have a much bigger dream beyond that even. My passion is to get people to not get sick in the first place. And when I take myself as an example, we run around too much. We probably drink a little bit too much coffee to keep awake. We worry a lot and life is not always or not often, I should say, in balance. For me, a huge dream would be to help people get to the place where life is in balance, where you have leisure time, you take care of yourself, you get massages, you get acupuncture, you go for hikes, you learn new things, you can have the luxury of being able to paint and learn how to do that. You can swim. You take care of yourself and you get balance into your life. And then work and play and self-care. Kind of help each other. Keep things interesting and keep body and soul and mind all in a happy state. Thanks for watching this episode of Business with Passion. If you'd like more information about Carola Dietrich, other shows, or perhaps to be a guest on a future show, go online to tv.manygoodideas.com.